We would like to welcome you to our new series on the book of Daniel, where God reveals the future history of mankind. Now, Daniel tells us we are in the last moments of human history and concludes with God's redemption of mankind. We invite you to stay with us. We know you will be blessed. I'm reminded of how much I need to know You are for me, you're not against me You are with me, I'm not alone Through all the darkest times and brightest days I know some things will always stay the same I'm not alone. Welcome. Hey, we're really glad to be back with you again this week. And we are working through the book of Daniel, and we are really excited. We are going to be looking at chapter 7, and we're into some of the really fabulous parts of this book. Uh, all of a sudden, you go back where we were in chapter 2, we jump into chapter 7, and it's like God is just going to pick up that story now. Now listen carefully, and He is going to enrich it. He is going to fill in details from chapter 2, to Daniel's mind. Daniel is going to record it so that you and I can look what God is trying to tell us centuries later. So I'm in anticipation of some really fun and exciting things for you to see here in a few minutes. I would like to just take you to the lost coast of California. Uh, this is probably one of the most uh, unique and uh, uh, subtly terrifying roads that you can find going down to the ocean. Uh, you come down this hill and it's about nine degrees and it looks like you're just going to drive right off the cliff and then you take a nice right turn. But it is a beautiful and very quiet place. Uh, I hope someday you get a chance to go there. It's really beautiful. So thank you, Sherry, for taking us there. Um, we'll have pictures of this several over the presentations. So let's jump into our study. Faith and Hope for Today is the name of our series. Chapter 7 in the book of Daniel. Daniel is shown the future. Now let me just clarify a couple of things quickly for you here. There's so many different opinions of Daniel. And one of them is, is you know, somebody came along and said, well, you know, really Daniel, the whole book of Daniel was really written by someone else way after it actually happened, like four centuries after it happened. And they're just looking back and filling in what they think the details were, which is a complete denial of God's ability to know the future. So there are those who just lack confidence in God's word. But we take the position that God is revealing to Daniel in his time so that centuries later we can see and understand what is coming and what is happening. So let's jump into chapter 7, verse 1, and it begins in the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon. Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed. Then he wrote the dream down and related the following summary of it. Verse 2, Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And if you remember in the book of Revelation, the great sea always represents people, nations, tongues, and languages. So the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. That's the multitudes on the earth. Four great beasts were coming up from the sea. That is emerging out of the populations of the earth, different from one another. And here the artist gives you a sketch of what Daniel is about to see. Verse 4. The first beast was like a lion and had wings of an eagle. I kept looking until its wings were plucked from it and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man and a human mind was given to it. Now, I'm just going to say that you will later on understand in the interpretation God gives 
this represents the empire of Babylon. And, it, and, and that standing up with the feet of a man and the mind of a man would kind of take you back to that story of Nebuchadnezzar where for seven years he wandered and was eating grass until his mind came to him and he praised God. Uh, and that kind of parallels this part of the story for you. So now moving right into verse 5, Daniel writes, and behold, another beast, a second one resembling a bear. And it was raised up on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth. And thus they said to it, Arise, devour much meat. And the artist has got those ribs there, and you can get a sense of this bear emerging up out of the sea. Uh, what a remarkable artist. I just appreciate his work so much. Verse 6. After this, I kept looking, and behold, another one, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird, and the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. That's really a spectacular picture, isn't it? Verse 7. After this, I kept looking in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, terrible, dreadful, terrifying, and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. Verse 7. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with his feet. And it was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. Fascinating, isn't it? When you just look at the description of how Daniel is describing these. And I've always appreciated the artist who had the courage to uh, just reflect on these words and then proceed to create in, in art for us, these beautiful images. But I want you to pay attention now to verse 8. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled up by the roots before it. So this horn uproots three others and emerges, and you can get a, just a real glimpse of the human face that is on it. That actually, here's what's really interesting about the artist's perception. He is actually telling you something important that Daniel is seeing in the vision. So when I read verse 8 to you, you're going to get a sense of why he has painted the painting the way he has. It says in verse 8, And behold, this horn possessed eyes like eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. Now, uh, some translations, as you dig deeper into the original language, would say uttering great blasphemies, claiming to be as great as God it could be a, a possible interpretation here. So this little horn is really about some pretty serious business. And then, all of a sudden, Daniel is going to see something different. Now, notice verse 9. I kept looking until thrones were set up and the Ancient of Days took his seat. So all of a sudden, as Daniel's watching these beasts emerge up out of the ocean, he sees these four beasts, he sees this little horn come up and uproot three others. This is all happening on the earth. All of a sudden now, in verse 9, he's looking into the heavenly realm. The Ancient of Days comes onto the scene and he's seen what is transpiring in the heavenly realm as this little horn power begins its work on the earth. Now here's what verse 9 reads. I kept looking until the thrones were set up and the Ancient of Days took his seat. Now a throne room in heaven is interesting to us because we know that the mercy seat in the Old Testament tabernacle represented the throne of God where the presence of God was in the earthly sanctuary. And now we're looking into the heavenly realm 
where we see now the throne of God. And not only that, there's multiple thrones for the 24 elders that are present there. This whole scene is set up. Daniel is watching it unfold. And here's the description continuing now in verse 9. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were like a burning fire. Now, all I can tell you is, is that, can you just imagine the challenge of trying to take that and create that into a, a visual image for us? These are powerfully descriptive words. Now we're in verse 10. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him, and thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him, and the court set, and the books were open. Now did you get the language, the court set? So there's something happening here in a court scene and a judgment is about to take place. Now notice verse 11, then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. So as this little horn is involved in its behavior, a judgment scene is coming into play in the heavenly realm. Don't miss that point. Now verse 12, for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. In other words, each one of these beasts would have a period of time from which to reign and to accomplish their purposes. Verse 13, things change again. I kept looking in the night vision, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. So now we're moving into the messianic aspect of the vision as we now see one like the Son of Man coming into the presence of God. Verse 14, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the people's nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. It is going to be an, eternity, an, an eternal and enduring kingdom. Now we go back to verse 15. As for me, Daniel writes, my spirit was distressed within me and the visions in my mind kept alarming me. In other words, this story he is recording has deeply, deeply disturbed him. And one should ask the question, why are you so distressed, Daniel? What is it about this story that is so unsettling to you that it causes you to be distressed? You and I should pursue a deeper understanding. So here we are, verse 16. I approach one of those who were standing by and begin asking him the exact meaning of all of this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Verse 17, these great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who will arise out of the earth. But the saints of the highest one, now let's talk about saints. Saints are not little statues, little statues that you put around your house or put around the church. A saint is simply a word that means the believer. So it would read like this. But the believers of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. Now that is an important verse. 
That's comforting now to Daniel. Remember his distress? Now Daniel has hope and good news in his vision. But he has a question. He needs to know more. So verse 19, he says, Then I desired to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceeding and dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its claws of bronze, and which devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And the meaning of the ten horns which were on its head, and the other horn which came up, before which three of them fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth uttering great blasphemy, and which was larger in appearance than its associates? Now that's a big question that Daniel is forming. He says to us now in verse 21, I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the believers, and overpowering them until the ancient of days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. Now, I want you to notice that I have put emphasis by putting verse 22, that first part, in italics and underlining it for you. And I want you to pay attention because most people think of the judgment, and I'm going to say historically what the Christian church has done is make the judgment story about an eternal lake of fire, and I don't know how they imagine it, but somehow God uh, must put you on a rotisserie and burn you over and over forever. But Daniel tells you the good news of the judgment isn't about being burned forever and ever. The judgment message in the book of Daniel reads that the Ancient of Days came, this begins under the reign of the little horn power, and the judgment was passed in your favor as a believer in the highest one. You see, the judgment is about your vindication and the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. Can you just take a moment and say, man, this is like the best news ever in the entire world? That the Ancient of Days came and passed judgment in my favor? The judgment is about the fact that you have been vindicated. I, I just sort of imagine that if the Christian church had this picture of the judgment in mind, that there probably could be tens of thousands of people that actually would be in the church today instead of using a pagan doctrine of an eternal fire and your immortal soul burning forever, which has its roots in Greek mythology, not in biblical scripture. This is good news. I cannot stress to you how important this news is, that the judgment is found in your favor. You have been vindicated because of your faith and belief in the highest one. That's the gospel in the book of Daniel. Best news in the whole world, isn't it? It says in verse 23, thus he said the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth and, tr I'm sorry, and tread it down and crush it. That fourth beast has some pretty amazing action taking place. Verse 24, as for the ten horns, now you're going to learn, this is the interpretation, out of this kingdom ten horns, ten kings... What are the horns? Ten kings that will arise. And another will arise after them, and he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. 
He will speak. Now remember I told you he was speaking blasphemy. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints. Now to wear down the saints is to persecute the believers of the highest one. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in law. And that law is divine law. He's going to make alterations in times and in law. Something to do with times and law. So this is a religious persecuting power who speaks blasphemy, which means this power is going to claim to be equal with God. Verse 25, and they will be given into his hands for a time, times, and a half a times. A time in Hebrew is a way of saying a year. Now here's the principle of understanding prophetic time. Numbers 14, 34, according to the number of days which you spied out the land, 40 days, for every day you shall bear your guilt a year, even 40 years, and you will know my opposition. This is what God is saying to Israel for their unbelief. Ezekiel 4, 6 and 7, as Ezekiel is warning the nation again, I have assigned it to you for 40 days, a day for each year. Now, I want you to understand that ancient Jewish scholars understood this principle and applied it appropriately at times. So did you get the principle about time? So it says, and they will be given into his hands for a time, times, and a half a time. It's a Hebrew, a Hebrew way of reckoning time. This is in the context of a prophecy. So we consider this prophetic time one day for a year. So time is one year, times would be two years, and a half a time would be a half a year. That is three and a half years or 1,260 prophetic days. And that should, should not say 126 days. It should, should say 1,260 days is 1,260 prophetic years in the solar candle calendar. This horn is going to persecute and rule for over a thousand years. That comes to 1,260 prophetic years in the solar calendar that this power is going to rise up and have the power of persecution. This power came into existence when pagan Rome came to her end and gave civil power and authority over to the early Christian church creating a strange and soon to be abusive power that reigned from around 538 BC to around 1798. Now let me explain that to you. We'll see more of this in Daniel 8 and 9, but very briefly understand this. The early Christian church in 538 BC gave the Bishop of Rome absolute power and authority. It would not be until the French Revolution that the Bishop of Rome would be incarcerated and put in prison, in prison exactly 1,260 years later. It would bring an end to that religious persecution. The French Revolution came into existence because of spiritual abuse of the church. And it brought an end to that reign of particular persecution. Verse 26. But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away and annihilated and destroyed forever. Verse 27, then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heavens will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will be given to him and serve him and obey him. Now, this historical event foretold to Daniel in chapter 7 repeat the same rise and fall of kingdoms of chapter 2. Chapter 7 reveals a new element of a religious political force that emerges near the end of time. When the Bishop of Rome became the Emperor of Rome, the Holy Roman Empire, if you would, began that persecution. Chapter 8 will add more important elements to the story. So what have we learned here in chapter 7? Well, what I, I hope that comes to your mind is this. 
that God has forewarned through the book of Daniel the Christian church of what they will become blasphemous if you would when the church embraces civil power and civil authority God never intended for the church to replace the Holy Spirit with civil authority and in every nation where Christianity has ever embraced civil power it has resulted in an alteration of the gospel and it has become spiritually abusive and it has persecuted its own people now that is embarrassing we should be humbled but folks God has told us this now we're having this conversation we live in a time in which pendulums swing both directions once to the left and once to the right but we have been watching for the last 200 years as there have been religious dogma who has desired civil power to institute state endorsed religion in our culture in our time in our place now I want you to know that it's legal to pray in school somebody once said there will always be prayer in school as long as there are math tests and I hope that is not just an amusing story I think it's actually true uh, if you remember your years in school but a state endorsed religion always results in persecution which religion is it that people want in schools today do they want Muslim religion? Do they want Christian religion? That's a challenge right there, isn't it? Because once you start putting religion in public school, then you have state-endorsed religion. Where does it stop? Daniel 7 is a warning to us. I want to take you to our last picture that Sherry brings us today. There's that seagull, found a great lunch, tide has gone out, and that bird is just having a feast. Those birds do an important work on our beaches, and I want to thank Sherry for that moment. I want you to go back and read Daniel 7 carefully. Where are you in this story? Are you all about the Holy Spirit? Thank you for watching today. Our email address is ScreamingRockMinistries at gmail.com or drop us a note to Screaming Rock Ministries, P.O. Box 5622, Twin Falls, Idaho 83303.